what will happen if I put a little bit of frankincense and eucalyptus oil? The, and in this process, concocted a liniment that was five times more powerful than tiger. And then it was popular in my clinic. And somebody, one of my patients said, you should, you should patent this. So I filed a patent and it went through. So the process between 2007, when the initial version came out, to the time when it actually became an FDA registered product was 2018. So almost 10 or 11 years. But there was a continual process of refining and improving. And at no point was the invention completely complete, but at the same time, it was never completely robust either. How well are you harnessing the ingenuity of the people around you? Welcome to another episode of Leading with Integrity, as we continue our exploration of the heart of leadership, taking a people-first journey this month. And today we'll be hearing from Dr. Ravi Ayer. He is a physician, scientist, author and inventor who has kindly agreed to share the story of his remarkable journey spanning academia, public service and private enterprise. From the corridors of academia to the dynamic landscapes of public and private sectors, today Dr. Ayer is a general practitioner. But he has arrived at that destination after what he calls a roundabout journey. In this episode, we'll be unravelling some of the threads of that journey, as well as what he's learned about life and leadership along the way. So whether you are a seasoned professional or an aspiring leader, Dr. Ayer's experiences offer a tapestry of wisdom to help you in your own leadership journey. So let's dive in and hear more about unlocking that human potential. This is Leading with Integrity, Leadership Talk, the podcast for first-time managers who are working in tech-driven businesses and teams and who want to be more effective, people-first leaders. Each week, you will learn the crucial strategies, mindsets, and practical tips that successful modern leaders follow to be engaging, ethical, and authentic managers who get the best from their teams. And we'll achieve all of this via weekly conversations with leaders, with leadership experts, entrepreneurs, and business owners, people who have already walked this path and have some amazing insights to share. With an added sprinkling of occasional solo episodes and some group chats where we'll have multiple guests. My name is David Hatch and I will be your host. And leadership has always been a passion for me. After a career spent in a series of small businesses during 15 years in the aerospace industry, five or six of those at the end of that career were in a space startup in the UK. So trying to launch satellites into orbit, very cool stuff. And through all of that experience, I learned that the secret to successful management is in the ability to apply great leadership. And in turn, the secret to great leadership, it's all about your integrity, putting people before profits. the Leading with Integrity podcast. Leadership talk for the modern manager. With your host, David Hatch. This episode is a bit different in one respect. And I do trust all of my listeners to go away and do your own research and form your own opinions and conclusions. However, this is a potentially controversial one. So I just wanted to give a quick sanity warning, health warning, a disclaimer, if you like. In this episode, we do talk a bit about the pandemic in terms that were outside of my experience and understanding. Some figures are quoted, such as total global death tolls. I haven't verified those figures. I have done my own research afterwards and since the recording. And unfortunately, there are some disputes around some of these figures. And so I just wanted to give you that health warning before you listen. As always, please do take everything with a pinch of salt. 
do your own research, do a bit of, apply a bit of critical thinking. Don't take any of this at face value and certainly don't equate it to my opinions on the subject because I'm not a medical professional and I can only base it on what I can find on the internet, much the same as you can. So there we go. So that was all. I'm just going to flag that now so you know it's coming and it's not an unpleasant surprise halfway through the episode. I just thought it would be best to mention it from the off. Dr. Ravi, thank you so much for joining me today, uh, particularly because of the time difference. I know it's half past five in the morning for you this morning. So thank you so much for the commitment of getting up that early. Really do appreciate it. Oh, you're very welcome, David. <laughs> uh, I normally get up around this time, so it's not that much of a big Okay, it just seems terrible to me. So <laughs> <laughs> The best place to start with the episode, as ever, is to hand over the virtual reins to you to... Introduce yourself to the listeners, tell them a bit about your, your background, your career history, and what you're currently working on. My name is Dr. Ravi Ayer. I'm a physician, what you British people would call a GP. Uh, I'm a GP, but I'm a GP who's come to the role of a GP in a very roundabout way. I got my physician's degree 40 years ago in India. Then uh, after doing a couple of years of uh, uh, training, I decided to completely switch fields and went straight into basic research and got a doctoral degree in biochemistry and molecular biology. And then came over to Harvard as a research fellow in medicine and uh, molecular biology. And I was at uh, the med school uh, and, uh, in Boston and uh, uh, with a dual appointment at the MGH uh, Cancer Center where I was working on the genetic control of uh, of the genes that are turned on in infection when 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 an infectious organism gets in how the body fights it and so that kind of work uh, took me from the MGH uh, to Dana Farber Cancer Institute in the Children's Hospital and I was working there for a few years and uh, then. I went to uh, Washington, D.C. to pick up a, a Young Investigator Award in 1980, 1993 um, and uh, bumped into the program director for uh, residency training at uh, George Washington University in Washington, D.C. And we got talking and he offered me a position there. So I came back and started as a resident, uh, finished my residency, sport, took some time to uh, do some clinic work. And I really enjoyed doing that in uh, in Northern Virginia and jumped ship again and uh, went into clinic, uh, basic uh, private practice as a GP. But with a twist where I wanted to do community medicine, but I also wanted to keep my hands in academia. So I continued to remain engaged in clinical research. And uh, over the years, my career has taken, it's been like uh, uh, the River Thames, uh, meandering down a lot of alleyways. <laughs> and uh, uh, Picking up a lot more than Moss, I can tell you that. Um, and uh, I've been a director of a hospice, a chairman of a hospital. And now I work um, as part of a 300 physician um, multi specialty group practice where I'm the director of clinical research in addition to running the IR clinic. So a lot of uh, roles over the years. I'm still very much engaged in clinical research. I'm still engaged in scientific uh, debate. Um, I'm right now very deeply engaged in the dialogue of uh, what we should do, what kind of checks and balances are required in for science to be conducted safely in this 21st century world where pandemics that kill 25 million are unleashed. So that's where we are. Quite a lot of diverse fields then. Is there is there a, a common theme that runs through all of those for you? Is there something that ties it all together or, or is it just kind of 
where the river takes you, as it were? No, there is a one common theme, and that is uh, from childhood, I've been completely fascinated by life. What, what, what drives me is the question is what makes life work? And when life does not work, how do you make life work? So, so all through my life, that has been the central theme. How do you help empower people to live their best life? And when circumstances uh, beset them with, uh, with issues that interfere with their ability to live productively, functionally, how do you set things right? So I always do only three things. See, patients don't come to me because they have a diagnosis. They are coming to me with a question, Doc, I, I have something that's preventing me from enjoying life the way I would like to. And I use my skill, my technique, my methodology, my, my knowledge to either remove the obstacle to whatever is blocking them from enjoying their life, if I can't remove it, I try to mitigate it. I try to reduce its impact. And if I can do neither, then I teach them to live with it and still continue to enjoy their life despite its presence. So it's always these three things. And for the execution of these three things, I bring into play all the tools of my life. Um, and I call these my talents. Uh, my, I have, I'm eloquent. I can, I have command of language, both spoken and written. I can use words to empower people. I have an incisive analytical mind that can analyze problems and break it down and search for uh, solutions. And when I don't have those tools, I go out and learn new tools. So I, I learned how to make medicines. I, I have uh, several FDA uh, approved medications that I created. So I have patents on, on inventions that I created. I have, uh, I, I created a company that, that makes, uh, uh, supplements and wellness products. And I know uh, every Tom, Dick, and Harry has a supplement out in the market, but the the ones that I make beat everything down by a factor of five to six fold because they are the only ones that got FDA approved as an actual remedy. So, so when you, when so that's basically my raison d'etre. How do you make life work? And my entire 40 years of my life as a professional has been dedicated to just the singular work in diverse aspects and diverse fields. So that's the unifying feature. That's the common thread that links all these pearls uh, into one long productive necklace well when you explain it that way it makes perfect sense <laughs> yes <laughs> so uh, what was it that originally sparked that interest i was always uh, a nature kind of person i would i would wander off into the creek and streams behind my school uh with a with a little uh, handkerchief uh, go fishing for tadpoles and zebra fish and bring it back and put them in a mason jar and watch them and look at, uh, you know. Uh, so right from a young lad, I was uh, in, was fascinated by life, by, by all things living. And uh, that just grew into a passion and decided that that's how I should do it. The, the one other thing that uh, came very early on in my life was I discovered that I had the ability to to enable the people around me to look at the bigger picture. So I could keep I could be a space where 
people could could be able to step away from the storm of their narratives that was um, driving them uh, crazy and uh, allow them to take a step back and see reality for what it is. And um, this, I, I discovered very early in my life that uh, most of us are bounce uh, in a kind of a ping pong way between the experience of our life and the narrative of our life. And more often we get trapped in the narrative and we forget the experience. And all performance and all excellence is only rooted in the experience and not in the narrative. That is an extremely interesting way of putting it. I, I really like that, actually. And we think about that in terms of leadership, in terms of people's experiences in the workplace, for example. It's very easy, isn't it, to get stuck in that narrative of, I don't enjoy my job, or I'm not getting on with, with my manager, or the grass is greener in that other job. Yes. You see, uh, David, one of the things that, and I like to explain it, uh, because a lot of people have resistance to understanding that that is the way it is. But I, I, what I, what I do is I explain it to people that, hey, this is how you, me, and the whole world was wired, and there's a purpose for the narrative. And I, and I'm telling you that purpose goes back to 10 million years of evolution. The fundamental thing that is common from an amoeba to the highest human being is this desire to predict what is likely to happen in the next five minutes. And this ability to predict is essential for survival. I'll give you an example. You take a drop of water from a pond and put it on a microscope slide, and you look at it under the microscope, and you will see this tiny amoeba floating around in this, in this drop of water. For this amoeba, this drop of water is the same equivalent of an ocean. Now, if you take that little drop of water on that microscope slide and you come in with a tiny glass rod drawn out to a thin line and you dip that glass rod in vinegar and you touch one side of the drop of water, the amoeba will move away from that side where the vinegar contaminated glass rod is touching the water to the opposite side of the water drop so that it moves away from the vinegar, right? So obviously the amoeba doesn't like the vinegar. Now you do the experiment a different way. You bring in a glass rod dipped in sugar and you touch it on another side of the water drop, the amoeba will move to that side. It likes the sugar. Now you go one more step. You keep repeatedly exposing the amoeba to the arrival of that glass rod dipped in sugar to the same side of the water drop. What will happen is the amoeba even when the glass rod is not present at that location, will remain in the vicinity of that location because it has now remembers that this area is where life is likely to present it with sugar. It remembers. An amoeba remembers. It is able to locate itself on one side of a water drop rather than the other side because of its history of, of uh, procuring something advantageous to it. An amoeba is showing predictive ability. Prediction is, this prediction is based on an internal narrative that creatures develop. A tiger that cannot predict where the deer is going to appear is going to go hungry. A deer that cannot predict where the tiger is going to appear is going to get eaten. So the ability to predict is based upon getting an experience for the first time, capturing it into memory, 
codifying it and categorizing it into some form of of images that form a narrative that you then use to analyze and do pattern matching against every other in experience that you get this is an automatic function of your consciousness your consciousness has two aspects to it one is experience the ability to perceive experience and the second is the ability to create a narrative out of the perception and the third aspect is what imprisons people and fossilizes them the the tendency to use narratives to define experience if you did not do that third thing unconsciously you will remain open to new experiences now in society different leaders leaders are usually people who are able to separate these two things and the best leaders can stay in the experience and they know when they are in the experience and they know when they are doing a narrative and they choose which narrative they want to give power to and the very very best of leaders not only give power to their own narrative they are able to create the narrative for the whole world that in essence is a leader yeah and no, i i can see the logic there um it's that third step as you say is where a lot of people get fossilized or lost or stuck or yeah and it's i wonder what it is about human nature that makes it so easy to get stuck in that rut and Because so difficult to get out of it it's convenient well so one of yeah. the things the one of the things of the human brain is it's the human brain is lazy it doesn't like to do work more than it has to if it has a prior pattern that will allow it to gain an advantage for itself by matching the prior experience pattern with the new experience then it does not have to wait and analyze and be alive to this experience completely it can quickly go and gain the fruits of its of that experience without any effort it is this intellectual laziness the evil of slot that traps you into the prison of your past i have another question for you about um innovation and and your experiences as an inventor but before we move on to that so the the, the point about intellectual laziness there i don't know if you've heard the the saying about um innovators and how the best innovators are lazy because they'll find the quickest e easiest and most efficient way of doing something what are your thoughts on that in the context of what you've just said so the best inventions are very very simple i would not call inventors as being lazy but they are masters at reaching what i call the tipping point in they they understand how to hone in to the essential question and the other thing about inventors is they do they do they are not victims of what i call the jackpot mentality there are people the best inventors are not interested in transforming the world they are interested in getting one problem solved they don't care if that is going to transform the world they are looking at one tiny solution and they will they are quite happy making one tiny little widget work and and then they will go to the next widget and then they'll go to the next widget and then that so so most the best inventors are not looking at oh i'm going to create the whole thing the other thing about inventors the really good ones they are uh, they don't they have a different relationship to failure they are more involved with understanding why some they look at events and not see failure and success is a narrative so 
it, it's an opinion about something after it has occurred. And inventors are not interested in the story of what has already happened. They are interested in why it happened. And they approach the why of everything non-judgmentally. And because of that, they will fail their way to success. But it is always the spectator standing outside, looking at this arena of, of the inventor who says, oh, there he failed. Oh, there he succeeded. The inventor, if you look at it, he will say, I succeeded all the way. Because all the failures showed me what won't work. And that way I succeeded in finding out what worked. So he never looks at failure as failure. He's been, he's been winning each time. So one of the things about pe people, people don't understand that running is nothing except falling fast. You fall into every step and you do it very, very fast. And in doing so, you, you zip down a hundred meters in 9.9 .9 seconds. Well, some people might. Uh, yeah. I, I certainly wouldn't. <laughs> And not me, <laughs> not me. But but you 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 get what I'm saying, right? People don't realize that. They don't realize that walking is nothing except falling with control. Yeah, no, I think you're, you're completely right about about failure, and it's 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 an interesting way of presenting it in terms of the context of narrative. And of course, it's hindsight, isn't it? Because at the time, you don't know. Even if you were to say there's an objective success or failure. At the time, yeah. you don't know that. You're just focused on the problem. Failure is more important than success, in my opinion, because you learn more. You need both. You can't, you can't, <laughs> you can't build a life failing because I'll tell you why. Well, in terms of the eventual outcome, I mean, if you succeeded oh, first time, you've not learned very much. You probably couldn't replicate. Exactly. It. So, but, but the thing is success, um, gives you the necessary validation to allow you to suffer failure. So you need to give small doses of success in a timely manner such that the person is allows, learns to persevere uh, through failure. But, but, uh, but you're right. Absolutely. But the people who really are inventing, um, who are creators, the creators of the world, they don't really look at their life as failure or success. They look at their life as one continuous journey of discovery. And that's all they're doing. They're discovering things that work and that don't, don't work. And any, anything that works and doesn't work is only contextual. Because in a different context, what does not work now will work for that context. So it's always contextual. And the same strategy that doesn't work in one set of business environment will work very well in another business environment. Yeah, I'm trying to think of a famous inventor who set out to solve a big problem. And I don't think there are any, are there? You're right, because they focus on the smaller thing. They're not worried about the changing the world level. Yeah. Quite a lot of the time, their inventions may end up in in one day, sort of doing that anyway. But that's I think you're right. That's that's not their intent at the time. They're just that's a problem. I'm yeah. interested in the problem, or the problem's annoying me, so I'm going to apply yeah. my intellect and I'm going it's to solve it. It's always personal. It's always personal. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's a very interesting take on that. I, I like it. <laughs> so, as an inventor yourself, as well. But what approaches, what methods have you applied or that have you found useful? And I'll give you an example. In 2007, my mom was visiting me and she was having arthritis and um, her knee was bothering her and she can't tolerate, um, you know, ibuprofen because it tears the stomach up. So I decided to concoct something and I at that time I was uh, reading a, a Sanskrit text and there was a line in that scripture that described how um, 
a particular saint in India had used camphor to reduce pain. So then that got me intrigued and I went and I got into my medicine closet and I pulled out tiger balm and looked at the ingredient and sure enough there was camphor there. And then I looked at it closer and said there were a couple of other ingredients. One was cinnamon. I said, okay, maybe I can make something for my mom using camphor and some of the herbs that I have in my kitchen. So I went to my kitchen and took a little brown coffee grinder, put some black pepper corn, ground it into powder, all right, and put it into a tea bag, you know, a muslin tea bag, ground some cinnamon, put that into a tea bag, took some red chili pepper, crushed it, put that into the same tea bag, bag, and dropped it into a small cup of olive oil and took a handful of camphor and put that in and put it up into a, a jar and left it on the kitchen counter. And for two weeks, every time I would come by the kitchen counter, I'd take the jar, shake it up, and then leave it and walk away. I kept doing that for about two weeks. And then after two weeks, the jar, the oil in the jar had turned very fragrant with the camphor and uh, it had turned all kinds of nice orangish red shade of pigment. And I took a, the, with a tablespoon, I took a, a spoon of that, rubbed it on my mom's knee, and she had relief. So I had discovered what would later become Dr. Ayer's bomb, uh, the Ayer bomb. And so then I started, I said, okay, since I already have my background, I, I, I set up a small uh, refining lab in my basement and started refining the process of extracting it to be more and more profound. From crushed red chili pepper, I went and got some ghost pepper, which is the world's hottest, hottest cayenne pepper. Uh, uh, you know, uh, refined a method for extracting the capsaicin out of that. And, um, you know, in, in this process, the invention of iron bomb kept improving. And then I, I figured, okay, if this is working. So what, what will happen if I put a little bit of peppermint into it? What will happen if I put a little bit of frankincense and eucalyptus oil? The, and in this process, concocted a liniment that was five times more powerful than tiger bomb. And then it was popular in my clinic. And somebody, one of my patients said, you should, you should patent this. So I filed a patent and it went through. Then I went to the FDA and I found the FDA allowed me to to register it as an OTC medication and it got registered as an OTC medication. So the process between 2007 when the initial version came out to the time when it actually became an FDA registered product was 2018. So almost 10 or 11 years. But there was a continual process of refining and improving and retesting and doing and all being done. And at no point was the invention completely complete, but at the same time, it was never completely robust either. I just kept refining it, like bringing out so many different automobile models with each, each one having a little extra feature. All right. That's the best example I can give of the entire inventive process. And so the answer is, the first thing is, find a problem that you can personally identify with. Almost all inventors have a personal relationship with the problem that they are doing. And then, because you need to have that personal connection to drive you through the ups and downs of the inventive process. Otherwise, you'll lose interest. If you're doing it for somebody else, you won't sustain it.
So that's something. And then once you do that, you keep, you keep dogging away at it, chipping away at it, refining it, almost like uh, Michelangelo chipping David out of the block of flawed marble. A fair number of parallels there to the, the kind of the iterative approach to software development. Like Very so iterative. Agile and, yeah. 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 yeah no, that's interesting. You've started your own business. You've spent a lot of time in academia. You've spent time in public sector as well. Those are three very different modes or ways of working. Um, they certainly, as industry sectors, operate very differently. What would you say are the major similarities, though? Because I'm always keen to hear from people who've worked in all three, because that's quite rare, I think. Academia has a lot of intellectual hubris. So... To succeed in academia, the qualities that really drive you is your ability to be intellectually very agile and sharp. But most academics are intellectual for the sake of intellectuality rather than necessarily. So there is a, there, I, I don't want to put down academics. What I'm saying is the, the culture of an academic is intellectuality for intellectuality's sake. So there is a, a kind of, uh, it, it, it's skewed p- partly for, to that level. Uh, the, 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 an academic would love to, to have nothing more than just delve into the abstractions of intellectual pursuit without any concrete um, material benefit being visible. And you need that kind of uh, isolated pursuit. Um, That happens. Um, So the... The danger of that is that you can get sucked into forgetting why you are doing science for, for one thing. You can forget that the value of whatever you are pursuing has value only if it is for the betterment of humanity. I'll give you an example. It is very important for, for people to understand that. Take, for example, we've just come out of a pandemic that killed 25 million people. We don't have the appropriate guardrails for virus research in this world. Two nuclear explosions, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, killed 250,000 people. And that spawned an entire atomic, International Atomic Energy Commission with enforcement capability to go into any nation in the world and shut it down if they don't adhere to appropriate controls and audits and inspections. There are sanctions placed. Economies are shut down. 25 million died in these last three years. We still don't have the guardrails. See, that's what I'm trying to talk about. Why, when you talk about academics, versus industry or public sector versus private sector. The the strength of each is undeniable, but you have to remember that they all serve human beings. So the common thread that needs to be connected through all this is how does it all serve human beings? In public sector, you have governmental policies. Policies are created. Frequently, policymakers make policy just because they like to make policy. They forget who it is meant to serve. Private sector. They are interested in the generation and creation of wealth. Public sector interested in the creation of governance. Academia in the creation of knowledge. So knowledge, governance, wealth. These are the three sectors. In Hinduism, 
there are three deities of this. One is the goddess of knowledge. The other is the goddess of wealth. And the third is the goddess of execution, of actively bringing. And that is what it is. Public sector is all about execution, all about governance. Private sector is all about wealth creation, the consolidation of wealth. The pursuit and consolidation of wealth is all there is about private sector. But in every point, if as long as people understand that to succeed in each of these three sectors, you need to be able to be good at the one salient feature of each sector. So to succeed in academia, you have to be very great, very good and competent in knowledge. To succeed in in um, uh, in the public sector, you have to be good in policy making. You have to be able to take the long view, the big view, to bring in as many stakeholders as possible. Be equitable, to be diverse. So the concepts like diversity, equity, inclusion need, are have great value in the public sector. In wealth creation, usually diversity, equity, inclusion are given lip service, but it is always subject to the ability to consolidate and create wealth. And I do, I'm, I'm, my own view of all these three is, I, is amoral. I, I recognize these as operative principles. I don't say one is good or bad, but you need to know what is the limitation of each other. And the only way you can thread these three sectors together properly is to always constantly ask the one fundamental question. Does this serve human beings? Who does it serve? And if you always ask that question, you will not go astray. The one thing that, this is why we need leaders. We need leaders like Gandhi and Ma Ma Martin Luther King, who are my favorite heroes, is that these people broke that and they said, okay, how do you get, uh, knowing that academia, public se sector, and private sector are oriented towards serving groups of people, how do you ensure that this definition of the group is expanded to the largest common denominator? So I don't have a problem as when you, the, the here the debate is, the, if both, all three serve a group. The problem is how they define that group. And this is where you work with a leader who can articulate the narrative of how you define the group. And that is why you need leaders of vision who can stand in the experience of being human and then look at everyone and say, hey, listen, guys, we, we are our best selves when we serve everyone. Yeah, I mean, I could talk a, another hour just on the political side of it, to be honest, but um, probably best not dwell too much on that. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, whatever you your views and same for the listeners about certain politicians or parties or whatever i think there's there's certainly in this country there's been a big lesson for us i think in the last five years about how our system works and how vulnerable it actually is to a bad actor if they get the wrong type of power and i don't know how i don't know what the answer is i don't know how we solve for that <laughs> Because I think a lot of, and it's, I think it's the case in the States as well, the way the political systems are set up, it's all done on the assumption of good motives of the people who have control of it. Yes, a lot of my own work uh, kind of shifted during the pandemic. Uh, and after the pandemic, I decided that I'm going to change tact and uh, uh, 
and that was one of the reasons why I wrote a book on that. And then I came out, uh, been very actively working on, on creating a dialogue where I talk about this whole thing about experience and narrative and leadership and why leadership and uh, one of the things that I I'm very vocal uh, I would say almost stridently vocal is the need for much better transparency and and governance in our scientific enterprises because science no longer is uh, can be trusted to the scientists. Uh, we need we need much bigger people out there uh, setting the guardrails because scientists by nature are intensely curious and they satisfy their intellectual curiosity. For the most part, they have very high levels of integrity and 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 social ethics and social consciousness. But all of those ethics, integrity, and social consciousness is still somewhat subservient to their innate intellect, intellectual curiosity and the desire to, to probe the dark corners of nature. And I have no problem with that. I, I really think that scientists should be encouraged to probe all forms of corners except that we need to have very, very clear guardrails to protect them as they venture into the unknown and ensure that the door is shut behind them, that they can't go around opening doors to the abyss without knowing how to shut the door behind them. And believe me, nature has unspeakable horrors in all forms of dark corners, things that you never even knew existed. There are viruses and bacteria that you don't know even live in the rainforests of this world. Well, that's a happy thought. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk a little bit more about leadership then. So one really interesting question I have for you is what has been your best experience of being led by a leader that you've worked with in your career? The uh, One of the biggest things that I've discovered uh, when I was uh, doing my medical training was this concept of the leader as a servant. I had a surgical, re during my surgical residency, I had a, physician mentor and uh, he impressed upon me the idea of what really makes a physician versus what is a technician he asked me this question once he says what is it that distinguishes what makes a physician a physician and I said oh you know ability to diagnose and treat and so on and so forth. He says, no. He says, the relationship that a physician has to disease is different than a technician. For a physician, a disease is a problem of empowerment. A disease is not a pathology for a physician. For a physician, the disease is a problem of empowerment. It is a situation that disempowers. And the, the physician's focus is to be a space of service that will allow the patient to become empowered. Whereas for a technician, the disease is simply a problem to be solved intellectually. So it is this attitude to service that makes a difference between a physician and a technician. He said that you may be wealthier as a technician, but you will always be happier as a physician. And he said, if, if you have a choice, Ravi, try to be a physician. There will be times when you'll have to be both. There'll be times when you'll be pushed in one direction or the other. 
But if you have a choice in the matter, choose to be a physician. So that to me is been the uh, mantra for my life. And that is where I that that is what fuels my all my arguments about why uh, the the vision always has to be centered on the human being. It has always got to be centered on how do you empower people to make their best decisions. How do you empower people to show up in the experience, and when they show up as part of the narrative, how do you craft that narrative such that it pushes them toward an empowered existence of their life? And that's all there is. And that is leadership. Uh, yeah, I was going to say that. That's leadership you just described there. Yeah, I mean, I, I've always been a big fan of, of servant leadership as well. Um, I mean, it's, it's quite a new idea as well. As far Actually, as it, is, I, it is not new. All the, all well, the greatest leaders were. They just didn't say it that way. It's new as a theory defined as yes. servant leadership. Yes. Um, but I think it's, it's particularly relevant now in the kind of the, I hesitate to say post COVID, but the since COVID years, just because of the way that we've had to start working now compared to how we were in the past and all of the, the mental health issues that have come up as, as a result of all of these challenges that, that the workers have faced. And I think, that whole approach now um, is much more powerful, much more relevant, much more useful than it has been in the past in a business setting, at least. And if you look at some of the other phenomena we've seen, the, the social phenomena like the, the great resignation and quiet quitting, all of those kinds of things as well, I think that points too to a, a need for leaders to be more turning that traditional leadership on its head, really. And rather than coming from a perspective of, I'm the boss, what are you going to do for me? Look at it the other way around and say, I'm the leader, what can I do for you? And I think that is that is servant leadership in a in a nutshell. And a very insightful leader as well that you've worked with there. <laughs> okay, a couple more questions and then we're probably out of time. So this one I quite like. I'll get some interesting answers to this one. If you could go back in time to the beginning of your career, um, say your, your mid-20s, early 30s, what advice would you give to your younger self? The one biggest thing that I could have, and probably I think it's something that's important for everyone, is take about five years and step away from formal education and spend those five years in deep contemplation to develop the skill of inner focus. Not just go and just contemplate, sit in some corner, uh, contemplating my navel. No, I'm, I'm not trying to do that. But really, really develop the ability to, to gain control over this automatic aspect of my psyche that builds a story and narrative about every experience that comes in my life. And, uh, so the level of control I have now, which I have acquired over 65 years of life, if at the age of 17 I said, okay, I'm going to just stop and for five years, I'm going to put my entire education on hold till 22. And I'm going to go and spend my time developing the ability to be present to my experience without building a narrative. Let the experience hold it. Gain control over this aspect of my life. I would have come back at 22 and I would have accomplished what I'm accomplishing at 65 by the time I was 35. Yeah, I think there's a lot to be said, isn't there, for, for taking that step early on. And particularly when, you, when you're getting to that age where you're just coming out of university, I mean... Yeah, it's it's quite a punishing period of life academically, isn't it? You've, I mean, that if you went from say in this country, say if you went from your like your first sort of secondary school exams right the way through to the end of university without a break, 
I mean, that's that's a decade or more of just constant testing. And, yes. and in hindsight, I don't think there's that much benefit to that in terms of what you're learning about how to operate in the real world. No. You're just you're, you're studying to pass a test. You're not studying to pass life. <laughs> it is and not only that you're studying to pro to pass somebody else's idea of what life should be like. Absolutely. And that is that is somewhat that is the most like imagine spending ten years of your life to get somebody else's opinion about it. Why would you do that? But yet you spend the rest of your life not trying to do that but you do that for the first 10 years or 12 years and that in uh, that institutionalization of our life is probably the single greatest uh, waste of time uh, i'm not saying that you should not acquire that body of information but there are better ways of doing it no i think institutionalization is exactly the right word for it Definitely. And it's, yeah, you're right. I mean, it's, I mean, you think about some of the things. So we had, when I was at school, we had this once a week, we'd spend a 45 minute lesson on something called life skills. And I look right now and what they did was taught us how to do a spreadsheet so we could manage our money. I was like, well, <laughs> that's not a life skill. I mean, it, yeah, it's important. Yes, but teach me something useful. <laughs> anyway. Uh, mustn't grumble, as they say. <laughs> Leadership heroes. Okay, last question. This one's always my favourite. I think you've already given given your answer away, but I'm going to ask you anyway. It's called Leadership Heroes. So if you had to pick a person, alive or dead, past, present, real, fictitious, if you want to go mad with it, um, who, in your opinion, would perfectly embody leadership? Who would that person be and why? Oh, the, yeah, you're right. I didn't give the answer. Yeah, so for me, both Gandhi and Martin Luther King, and they're actually identical in many ways, uh, and they also have the same uh, mentor. Um, you see, Gandhi... His mentor was um, Henry David Thoreau of Walden Pond fame. And it was Thoreau's writings on civil disobedience that Gandhi used to launch his uh, uh, entire career of, of saying that the power of no of a single man saying no is more powerful than him. You know, the only power that a, that a government has is one of denial of life and liberty. And therefore, if you are willing to give up those two items, then you have broken the shackles of, of governmental authority. Um, and then Martin Luther King borrowed that same thing for his uh, civil disobedience movement. So, but to just simply say that is probably um, oversimplifying the depth that both these leaders had to them. Um, both were, were men of great grounding they 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 were grounded in a vision of themselves that was so profound that they could not only see themselves as as emancipated but they saw an entire race as emancipated um so so to be grounded that firmly is the, the quintessential definition of a leader. So for me, both of these are the models for any person who wants to craft a life of purpose. And it doesn't matter that I may never even talk uh, about, the, about the things of civil rights that Martin Luther King did, or I may not do anything 
like the way Gandhi did. I do my own stuff in my 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 area of being an advocate for transparency in science. We advocate for for the humanistic aspects of diversity, equity, and inclusion in healthcare policy or healthcare delivery. So that is that is my that is my uh, civil rights march. And and it's okay that I do it alone, but that's fine. But that's where I get my inspiration from. The two excellent examples. I think it, it's always a bit touch and go, I think, picking historical figures, but particularly because the further back you go, the harder it is to know for sure what they were really like. Um, but I think with those two, it's probably recent enough history that we know quite a lot about them. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, so you're probably on safer footing, uh, say, than compared to picking a Roman emperor or something. I think the other problem is um, this idea that heroes have to be uniformly good is another myth. I am not subject to that. I don't care if my heroes are flawed. The fact that they accomplish so much is worth emulation. Mm. And if if I do detect any flaws, it is up to me to not emulate that. But why should I throw them down from a pedestal and say they are worth nothing? No, they are worth yeah. something. You know, if I see something not worth emulating, I don't emulate that. But that doesn't mean I, I suddenly tarnish the other stuff just because I saw something that was not worth emulating. No, I think you're right. It's it, And it's... It's somewhat of a trick question using the word perfect because obviously I'm asking you to pick a human and humans are not perfect. We are flawed cr creatures, aren't we? So there's obviously that aspect of understanding it. But I think what both of those men had in common was the grounding that you've spoken about, but what that allowed them to achieve, the fact that they were fighting for a common good, an ethical right, and they were both able to inspire their followers in a way that, again, is associated with the greatest of leaders. So I think two really, really good picks. Well done. <laughs> Thank you. I think we're, we're almost out of time, really. So the, the very last thing is, if any of the listeners would like to learn more about you or reach out, perhaps, and have a conversation with you themselves, would you like to put them towards a website or whether they could get a copy of your book or anything yeah. else, really? So, um, yeah, and all the stuff that I do, um, my, my professional work as a physician, my work in, in all my professional life is all tied in into one location. Um, it's my, my author website is, uh, www. I'll spell it out. D as in David, R as in Robert, I, Y, E, R, Dr. Iyer, dot com. Um, and you can, Follow me. You can watch my YouTube channel with all my speeches and stuff like that. Uh, you can email me from there. Excellent. Well, I'll put the link to that website in the episode description as well so everyone can find it easily. And that's all we've got time for. All that's left for me is to say thank you again, Ravi, so much for your time this morning. It's been great talking with you. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Well, I hope you enjoyed this conversation and found Dr. Ravi Iyer's journey as inspiring as I did. Those lessons from academia, public service, private enterprise really paint an interesting picture and tell such a good story about his journey to where he is today. If you want to learn more, check the episode description now. You'll find Dr. Iyer's information, links to his website and so on. If you haven't subscribed to us yet, Hit that button now and stay tuned for more. And listener, I do want to thank you for your dedication to Leading with Integrity and the kind reviews that many of you have been leaving. Please do continue to share your thoughts and join us in the next episode as we will be concluding this month's theme of the Heart of Leadership with my next guest, Krissa Boyce, an executive coach, fractional COO, and former senior executive in a Fortune 500 company. Krissa and I will be discussing all things leadership, including the challenges faced by first-time leaders, the similarities and differences between big and small teams and big corporates and small startups, 
how our biases can affect our leadership and more. It's going to be an excellent conversation to round up our People First November series. So I hope you'll be able to join us again. In the meantime, keep thinking about how you can best or better harness your team's potential. Keep putting your people before profits and be a leader, not a boss. Thank you.